All right, I think we're good. We're ready to go. Chapter one. in the background. <laughs> All right, so hopefully you were able to get through chapter one this week. So I want to begin with prayer. And then I think we have a microphone this week. We had a lot of conversation last week that the people online couldn't hear. Um, so we're going to try to pass around a microphone. Um, here's my one request. Don't let the microphone keep you from saying what you have to say. Because, uh, yeah, I know how this goes. The minute you stick a microphone in certain people's faces, they have nothing to say anymore. So uh, the microphone is going to come around. Uh, it's just for us here and everyone from here on out through all eternity who turns on YouTube. Okay, uh, So don't worry about it. It's no big deal. Um, but we do want those who are listening uh, online to be able to hear some of the discussion. So let's, let's pray before we start, and then we will jump into some of the questions here. Father, uh, we pray that you would guide our conversation. Uh, we pray that uh, we would both learn uh, how to respond to painful circumstances ourselves, uh, and also how to help those who are suffering uh, turn to Christ. Lord, we pray this time would be a time of encouragement for your people. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I just want to begin by uh, noting that James is the only one not sitting in the center section. <laughs> and calling that out. Um, you're welcome to join the rest of the crew. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then I would like to follow that up by saying... Uh, and just turn it over to you maybe for a few minutes before we get into specific questions and, and ask, seriously, the back row? Man, <laughs> it didn't have to be the front, but the back. Uh, but I'm, I'm curious to know, uh, as you read through this chapter, what, what stands out to you? What, what are some things that were takeaways for you from chapter one? You know, as you're reading some of your like highlighters, uh, what were some of those things that you maybe highlighted? or read and said, man, I need to remember that, or that's really helpful. What were some of those things for you? James? Hold on for the microphone. <laughs> Hello. Just that lament is how we learn to live between the pulls of a hard life and God's goodness. Uh, statement there. Yeah. Did that work? Yep, okay. I think so. Uh, yeah, I, I, I thought that was a helpful statement, too, that lament is how we learn how to live between the poles of God's goodness and, and the suffering that we face in this life, uh, which is important because a lot of times suffering is the reason people use oftentimes to not believe in God um, or, or to reject the idea of God. As a matter of fact, um, just yesterday, Bridget was like, oh, I was going to send you this story because I thought it, it would be really useful as an illustration at some point in a sermon, and now here it is this morning. Uh, do you care to share the story? I don't, I don't know that I know it as... Oh, wait on the microphone. Okay. So it was an article that Fox News, I think, posted, and it was a lady that she supposedly, according to the article, was reading the Bible at night to her daughter, and a stray bullet went through the house and hit her and killed her. And so I was reading through the, oh my God, I was reading through the comments that people posted, and they were basically a lot of the comments were, "This is why you shouldn't be religious. This is why you shouldn't be a Christian. Like bad things happen to Christians." And that was the gist of the story. Yeah. So, so th there's this idea that because believers suffer in some way, uh, Christianity must not be real. Um, and sometimes I think we struggle with that ourselves. What do we do in the middle of pain with the promises that we know God has made to us? Um, and lament helps us, I think, bridge that gap sometimes. What else stands out to you before we get into some of these specific questions? Yeah. 
Yep, microphone. Right here, front row. Okay. Um, so the one, that the, the line that says lament is a prayer in pain that leads to trust. Because yeah. oftentimes in the struggles or whatever it was, in your praying, it's almost like by the time you get to the end of your prayer, you're realizing or you're acknowledging the, you're trusting the Lord in this situation. But at first, you're very broken, at least for me. Yeah, which, which goes right back to the, the title of this chapter, right? Keep praying. <laughs> Keep praying. Um, when, when there is pain, when there is suffering, uh, we should turn to Christ, and we should keep going back to him, right? Um, that's good. Anyone else? Yeah, Gene. I think I can talk well. I'm afraid that I can't. Uh, where it says... Lament, uh, lament is a path to praise as we are led through our brokenness and disappointment. Uh, when I was going through the death with my, uh, the death of my husband, it's like I had to learn that. I had to learn that praise, the praise part. Um, after months, I finally learned that, for, you know, but that stuck out to me. Yeah, that's good. Anyone else? Let's get into some of the specific questions here. Uh, I don't know that we'll go through all of them depending on how the conversation goes, but that clock is not correct, is it? Is it? Maybe it is. Okay. All right. Um, so what makes lament Christian? All right, so we, we, we read, we're starting to unfold what lament is in this book. What makes it Christian, and why does it take faith to lament and and maybe we just back up here for a minute and he begins this chapter by saying it's human to cry right uh, it's human to cry we are born crying but there's a difference between lament and crying what is that difference and what makes lament christian barbara oh i'm sorry joan When Brad and I were looking through this, one of the questions we came up, up with is, what in, if, if lament is Christian, what's the difference between mourning and lament? Yeah, that's a good question. So I'd, if we get into the very specifics of the language, I don't know that there's going to be a ton of difference. But in what he's trying to draw out in the lament and what you see in the lament is a specific pattern. Uh, so it may include mourning, but the pattern is that it's going to lead you through that mourning into faith or ultimately into praise. So it's a pathway to get from simply mourning because things are sad and hard to go from that to seeing God and, and maybe his purposes or maybe experiencing his grace in that mourning, right? So mourning, I think, could be kind of like crying, could be a completely negative thing we're seeing a bad situation we're experiencing a bad situation uh, we're expressing that grief but if we never find a path out of that grief into praise or into faith um, then we're stuck and so I think what what the lament does is it kind of gives us that pathway right it recognizes that pain and mourning and crying are real they're legitimate um, but there's a pathway from that uh, oftentimes it's still in our tears uh, to praise and, and uh, to glorify God in faith. Um, I know I saw Riley's hand. I was going to say that what Bridget was talking about with the loss of a, uh, a daughter and, and the comments that were made um, that were uh, devoid of any thought of Christ or God uh, and what he does for us daily. Uh, y you know, in the case of losing a child or losing a parent, we can go to God and, and in lament, if you will, uh, come to a point 
where we, you know, where, where we are uh, more at peace with what has happened. You know, God, and, and, and that's only because of faith. You know, I, I thought about the first question that the author asked. And, you know, if, if, you, if, if you are not Christian, and, and I'm looking at Christianity specifically because we believe that there is only one God, and he created and controls uh, all that we see from physical existence, and, and he is in charge of the spiritual aspects of life. We can, cr we can cry out to him. Uh, and, that, and it does turn to trust, especially if we know him. If we can look back at his actions in our lives and see that he is good, that what he wants for us is goodness. The fact that things happen to us um, doesn't negate that. Point of fact, he says, uh, trials will come. Sorrows will come, but he will be faithful and be with us through all of those things. And that's what. Yeah. Yeah, being, being a Christ follower does not insulate us from suffering in any way, does it? Um, and by the way, you said we had that discussion last night, you know, to go back to the story that was on Fox News that Bridget mentioned. And Part of my response to that now is come hang out with me at my other job for a couple days and let me show you. Because one of the responses was, well, see, this is why being a Christian, like all these bad things always happen to Christians. Well, well come hang out with me for a while. I'll show you a whole lot of evidences where that's not the case, uh, where Christians are spared a whole lot of pain and grief um, that, uh, that many in this world experience. So I have a question. Um, is in the scripture, the laments seem to be all one time period, like it all happens right there, and they go through this whole thing, but does a lament have to be all at one time, or can it be a process where you're going through this, taking this long time period, and where at the end you finally come to praising God? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think the, the pattern that's laid out in a lament is a pattern that we should strive for, right? Um, and so that pattern that he lays out is that there is this initial turn to God in our pain. That's the, the very fact that we're praying, right? That's the turning part, uh, which, by the way, is why it requires faith to lament. Because if I have no faith, I'm not going to turn to the Lord, right? So it requires faith to lament because if I don't have that faith, I'm never going to turn. Um, so it's turn, and then you get to voice your complaint, which I also think is interesting because we are always told we should, you should never ask God why. And yet we have all of these psalms where, you know, the psalmist is saying why. <laughs> why and how long and, and where are you and, and asking questions of God. But those questions are also bringing us back to faith in the Lord. Uh, we're, we're turning back to the truth. And, and that's, where, that's where we're headed. And then it is that truth that allows us to respond with uh, thanksgiving or praise even though the painful situation hasn't resolved. So I think that's the pattern we're striving to follow every time. But I think we've all probably been alive long enough to know that sometimes that process gets hijacked. Sometimes it's hard to get all the way through that. Uh, sometimes we might get through and ask the question and find, I, I don't know where else to go from here. And, and so I think there is uh, both a desire to get through that and, and to experience the grace of God, but also it's a call, right? Understanding that we're, we're not going to respond correctly every time, and it might be a bit of a process for the Lord to open our hearts and to show us what we need, and that's why it's so important these laments are here, because we can see the pattern repeated over and over and over again. Um, I think he mentions in this chapter that a third of the 150 psalms, almost a third of them, are lament psalms. And then we have an entire book called Lamentations, right? Uh, it is a book of lament. Um, it's to show us the pattern that we are striving for. Um, so very long way of saying, yeah, I think sometimes it can take us a while to get to that point. But by faith, and, and perhaps as we mature as believers, we, we learn and we get there quicker. Right. Um, I think that it's a process. It's a, for me, it was a process, and it was a. Um, it was a 
was a torturous, um, long process for me with my husband. Um, but I think that I will always have to do that over and over and over again um, through my life. But I think that going, once you do that for the first time, then the next time that something hard hits you or hits your life, it's much easier for you to get into that lament um, quicker than, than what it took me the first time to, 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 to uh, realize that that was, that by doing that, I got through that grief quicker the next time. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, experience with God's grace uh, kind of leads us into, you know, this pattern. Of, uh, it's easier for me to expect God's grace the next time, right? Uh, he's been faithful in the past. He'll be faithful in the present. And uh, that experience teaches me that Lee's lament can happen in, in a single prayer. Um, but oftentimes it's our faith that, yeah, I'm not sure, right? So we hold back, um, and, and we're not sure if we can fully trust uh, or, or believe that God has good for us in this, believe that he is worthy of praise through this. Uh, our faith restricts us from that sometimes because it is, it, because it is too small. Um, but we're willing to experience and through the trust to turn and keep turning, um, that experience will teach us that grace is available. I saw, did I see another hand? All right, so... Uh, another question here, I want us to, to kick around just a little bit, and this is more just personal testimony. What are some of the hard and painful questions that you've asked God over the years? So part of the lament pattern is asking questions to God. Where are you, O oh Lord? Or how long, O oh Lord? Are you going to forget me forever? And we talked last week about what some of those painful situations that we've experienced uh, some of you were willing to share what those were, um, but the question now kind of dials in a little deeper to go, in those painful situations, what was it that you were asking God? What questions were on your heart that you felt you needed answers to? Lisa? Why is it taking so long for you to save my son? Or are you going to save my son? Yeah, how long? How long, oh Lord? What else? I, you know, how long are you going to feel this despair, the emotion behind grieving and lamenting and the heaviness and um, even the cloud, the darkness, you know, how long am I going to feel this way? Um, why do I feel this way? Why can't I talk about why I'm feeling? I'm very thankful that we're going through this. I'm sorry I wasn't here last week. As Mike Edgar Dahl would say, it was my birthday. Yeah, was my birthday <laughs> in, case, in case anyone didn't know. But um, no, this is, this, is, this is something that's very close to my heart, you know, the power of confessing, confessing to one another and how God uses that to answer those questions. And um, I share about Christ comparing us to a wine sack, right? And we've got generations of men that have never talked about anything but work and were raised that way and have bottled up, myself included, bottled everything up for a long, long time. And um, it's very, all I can say, I'm very thankful and refreshed. It's a refreshing feeling to be able to talk to guys close to you that you can trust, which is a reflection of what they're talking about here, that grace and trust in, in God, that he's, he's there in it all. You don't know the answers, but you know he's working it out, and you give it over to him, which the world stops short of that all the time. It's hey, get counseling and take a depression pill, you know, and nothing against taking anti-anxiety pills or depression pills, but when you leave Christ out of the equation of, and allowing to use all that for good, then you, you, you're just stunted. You're in a, you, you stay in that hole and, and uh, you have temporary relief and, uh, from different things, but not, it, 
not eternal relief and, and you don't find that peace that comes from knowing Christ. So I just want to say I'm thankful for this, the start of this series. Yeah. I, and I think that hits on an important point that the, the benefit of corporate lament uh, in, in bringing other people into my lament. Um, sometimes we isolate ourselves because we're almost embarrassed that we have to lament. We're almost embarrassed that we're asking these questions. And so part of the reason that I'm asking you to come forward with these things now is because I want you to know and I want other people to know that these are legitimate things. They're, they're, they're legitimate questions. And the scripture legitimizes the asking of those questions. Um, now it's important that we not ask them in unbelief, right? We're asking in belief. And, and there's the difference. We're questioning God in unbelief, accusing him of wrongdoing. Uh, that's a problem. But if we were asking God in belief, going, man, God, and, and, and the difference is this. God, I, I know your promises. I know you're near to the broken heart. I know you are good. I know all your plans are good. But where are you right now, right? That's the difference. Then, then coming to God and going, forget you, man, right? Like, like, like I don't even see you, and, and so I'm just going to give you the, the silent treatment or I'm, or I'm just walking away, right? Uh, to ask in faith is, to, uh, is part of the essence of what it is to lament. Riley, and then we'll come to Bridget. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, you know, Terry and I have been married a long time. We have three grown adult children. Uh, all of whom are single. And we continue to pray for God to bring godly men in, in the case of our daughters, and uh, a godly young woman into the life of our son. And, you know, it, it is something that we've wondered about, uh, certainly, and prayed about. Uh, we continue to pray about this, but um, it is something we struggle with. You know, there, clearly there are other struggles in our lives, but, you know, that's something that we've, we don't understand at this point. That's good. Bridget? So I guess my question is, is there a wrong question you know you said you can ask questions in belief but not in unbelief but for instance I think everybody without even saying it would your first question is why why is this happening to me why did you allow this to happen to me that type so is is that question wrong to ask or is there a question that's wrong to ask through the process so it's interesting you a couple of people have raised the question why and I think oftentimes that's the first question on our mind um, but even in the Psalms, even in the lament, uh, the question why is raised. Why are you hiding yourself from me? Right? There, there is this desire in us to be able to understand. Right? I think my mom would tell you that was probably my most common question growing up. Right? You tell me to do something, my first response is, well, why? Uh, because I needed to know. And I felt like if I knew the explanation and the reasons, and if I judged those reasons to be reasonable, then I would willingly participate, right? Um, if not, then we might have a discussion on our hands. Um, but, but there's a part of us that, that when things happen, we feel like if I understood all of the purposes here, then maybe I could handle it better, right? If, if you know, my, my son dies, or my husband dies, or my... Uh, you know, something tragic happens, if you give me a reason, God, then, then I can trust you, right? Then I can see, oh yeah, God does work all things together for good, right? So is it legitimate to ask that question? Let me put it to you. Is it legitimate to ask God the question, why? Is it okay to ask that question? We want to know the answer. All right, some heads nodding yes. Many people looking down going, please don't call on me right now. <laughs> Riley? I saw it.
Sorry. No, it's all right. Did you guys want to add to that? No. Not that last part. The part. <laughs> no, it's all right. Yeah. So I, I don't know. The, I don't know. The, and I'm trying to think off the top of my head. Is there any illegitimate question to ask God? I, I think the the issue is the manner in which you ask the question. What you got, Mike? We need a mic, a mic for Mike? Um, yeah, I was just thinking of uh, Job and his suffering, and if you read the book of Job, he asks some pretty intense questions to God, even suggesting that God is unjust, and I'd like to go to court and... I'm the complainant and he's the defendant because he has been unjust to me. And so let's set a date, God, and how about you show up and explain yourself to me? And then God speaks to him and says, who is this that darkens counsel without knowledge? Stand up and let's talk. And uh, then he asks him all the where were you when questions. And Job, at the end of the day, says, I thought I knew you because I'd heard about you, but now I've experienced you, and so I repent in dust and ashes. So, I mean, here's Job levying not just complaints, but some pretty intense accusations at God. And at the end of the day, God understands that Job is dust, you know, he knows our frame and remembers that we're dust, and he, uh, he makes a spectacle of Job, I mean, he's, this is God at his saltiest, I always tell my students, and, uh, and yet there is a compassion of a loving father behind his chastising and you know, he understands. And it is interesting, you know, I agree with Riley that sometimes through the pain we do come to understand maybe this is why, maybe this is why, but Job is never given never any an kind of explanation yeah. as to why. God could have said, look, Satan came and I needed to make this point and blah, 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 but he doesn't. And so Job goes to his grave never understanding why. And so I think the book of Job teaches us that you know, in this world, God has designed this world. Uh, he, he could have prevented all suffering, but he doesn't. And instead of explaining why there is suffering in the world, he invites us to rest in him and trust in him in the middle of our suffering and pain. So I don't know that there's any question off limits to God, but, you know, the, the hard attitude is what he's after, I think. Yeah. yeah and, and so you have to wonder that is maybe the, the thinness of our theology, particularly our theology of suffering, is it related to our unwillingness to ask God hard questions? Right? Like, like we, we just, oftentimes we're good with the surface level. Hey, you know, well, um, we're almost home, right? Great. Love that song. Love the theology of it. But it's almost kind of this pie in the sky, everything's going to be all right kind of thing, and we live in this Christian triumphalism, and we never ask God hard questions. And so we never, we never get beyond the surface. Job asks God hard questions, pointed questions, and what does he get? He doesn't get explanation as to why things happen. He got a revelation of God that he had not seen before, right? I think we would be wise to sit in our suffering sometimes and lament, why, God? It doesn't match what I believe to be true about you. I'm having a hard time reconciling your promises and my pain. And I think the willingness to sit there and sometimes ask those questions, and, and again, I think the issue comes in, like Mike said, it's the hard attitude. What are you gonna do with the response that comes? You know, whether it's a time period of silence like Job got for a while, 
Or when the answer does come, it's, hey, you need to know more of me, and this is what you need to know. I'm going to know, God, that's not enough, right? Like, I, I need you to tell me exactly, right? Because uh, I don't get it. And I don't know that in the midst of God revealing himself to us, I don't know that we're going to ask that question. I think we're going we're gonna to find what we're looking for. Um, but uh, I, I think there's something to be said here for a willingness to sit with God and ask those questions. Anything else on that particular question? Um, as you think back, I'm going to do kind of a two-part question here. As you think back on you know, the, the painful things that you've experienced and God's faithfulness through those times, uh, a number of you have said over the last two weeks, yes, I experienced painful circumstances. God faithfully brought, brought me through it, and that has informed how I face circumstances today. Um, what portions of Scripture do you find yourself coming back to that kind of serve as anchors for you? Um, and, and then out of that, um, how does the lament connect theologically in your life? In other words, what, what does it tell us about God and, and, and about how we respond to him or how he responds to us in our situations? Um, what are some of the scriptures you go to and then what's the connection here with our relationship with God and what we can know about him, theologically speaking? Sarah? And this might not answer completely, but I feel like the book of Psalms has been really helpful in general because of David's transparency in his questioning and, and all of the emotions that he's gone through. It, for me, it's always solidified that it's okay to have emotions. Sometimes people like to tell <laughs> girls to stop crying. Sometimes that's okay, but emotions are real, and, and David really clears that up for us. Um, and as, to answer the question about how it has solidified who God is in our lives, or however you ask that question, um, I think the different sufferings that we've gone through or have faced alongside other people have for me solidified that um, he is in control even though I don't like it and I don't like his plan um, and I and it's okay to sometimes tell him that um, and because open communication is really good because First off, God already knows what I'm thinking, but I need to be able to say it so I can start working through it and work on my relationship with him. Yeah, that's good. It, it, it is interesting to consider, you know, sometimes we like to put the mask on and pretend like everything is okay. Um, but then just consider uh, kind of the hypocrisy of that. Like, like how grateful are we that David was open, you know, with his emotions and his struggles with the Lord and that we have so much of that uh, written down for us. What else? What are some of the passages? I've got one, actually. So, um, Colossians 3.15 says, And let the peace of the Messiah, to which you were also called in one body, control your hearts. Be thankful. And that's been a verse for me uh, over the last, uh, maybe like a year, six months, something like that, that I've committed to try to remember in all the scenarios that I've been in with life. And it, to me, it just helps me remember that, you know, God is a God of, of peace, ultimately, in the hearts of those who believe in him. Um, and that peace is something that should control your heart, not fear and, you know, discouragement or depression or any of those types of things, but that peace of who Christ is and who God is should be uh, the controlling factor so that's something that I've leaned on a lot recently. And even like the author mentions that lament is essentially a, it's a bridge, if you will, is what lament is. So I, I see lament as taking you to that peace of the Messiah and who he is. That's good. Anyone else? June? 
One of the scriptures that kind of um, hit me a lot when I have uh, a trial in a, in, is James 1, verse 2. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and on. And it, it kind of, for me, gives me the comfort that God is doing something through the trials, that there is an, an answer to the why. It does bring something good, yes. even though it's difficult. Yeah. Yeah, there is an answer to the why, even though we might not know what that answer is, outside of it's good, right? God is going to do something good. Um, but there is an answer, and that answer works perfectly in his plan uh, and is producing something in us. It's good. What else? Oh, pass it up here to <laughs> So I have a question that's not part of your question. Is that okay? Sure. Okay. So um, my question is, did, you know, all in scripture talks about how Jesus was human, fully human and fully God, experienced things that we've experienced. Did he experience lament? And if he did, what did he or would he have asked the same questions to God that we ask to God? Or would he not ask those questions because he was fully God and without sin? Yeah, so the first thing that popped into my mind was, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Right? I, I think there is lament in that request. Um, so, yeah, it gets, it gets a little challenging sometimes, so, you know, uh, the, the whole hypostatic union issue uh, between Christ's humanity and his deity, but... Uh, we kind of rest in the scripture that Christ um, did experience life in the same way that we experience life. Um, and I think that would include lament. And though maybe it's not voiced, I think you see it in circumstances like at the grave of Lazarus, where Jesus weeps, right? Um, I think there is inherent in that weeping a lament. Um, and he even turns that then on, on kind of this theological thing, right? Uh, this has happened because you're going to see the power of God. Uh, if you believe in me, I am the resurrection, right? Uh, so there's, there's connection to future hope, um, but there is mourning, uh, and, and the hope comes through the mourning and through the weeping. And even though we don't have record of them in the Gospels, there are plenty of Messianic Psalms yeah. where the Messiah is lamenting being surrounded by bulls and you know lions and that sort of thing so he clearly had the spirit of lamentation even though you know there's not a ton of it recorded in the gospels we know that he did because of the psalms about him yeah that's good on the cross too my god my god why have you forsaken me yeah yeah <laughs> So when, when we went through what we did, one of the first hardest things that we did as a married couple that we went through, um, it was a lot of lamenting that I didn't understand that's what was going on at the time. But um, afterwards, and I, it, it was a couple years, I believe, before I came to this realization of how to lament properly, how to get through the, one of the hardest things as, as a young married, as a young Christian, as a young person. Um, but the verse, that will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. It took me a while to figure, to get to that point that I was trusting that what happened was a good thing. And, but it was almost like when we got there, going through it, there was no peace. There was no way to make any sense out of all the uh, sadness and hurtfulness. And, um, but once, once I got to that place to where I could keep my mind on the scripture and on his word, the peace came and the trust came. Um, so that, that verse has always been good. It, it truly is where you keep your heart and mind on those things. 
That's good. I know we're about out of time. I, I would say, too, if, if you're in this season of lament and, and maybe you're not quite sure where to go with that praying, I think the two things that you want to come away from this chapter with is, number one, keep turning to the Lord. Keep turning to the Lord, and in that process, um, asking hard questions, remembering his faithfulness from the past, and then when you kind of run out of things, like, I don't even know where to go anymore, Lord, remember and pray the gospel. Because it is the deliverance that Christ has brought to us through his cross that guarantees that all of this works together for good. Pray the gospel. Go back to the certainty of the deliverance that Christ has brought, right? Uh, focus on him and, and kind of let that guide you even when maybe there's not other specifics that are, you know, you're quite ready to pray other things yet or even sure how to pray. The gospel kind of becomes our guide. Uh, Christ has brought us deliverance and uh, in him we can hope and, and rest. Um, I think that's it. We'll uh, read chapter 2 next week. I think we're going to start getting into some of the specifics of the lament, kind of digging down into each of the aspects uh, of what lament is and spending some time there. So uh, thanks again for the discussion, um, and uh, hopefully the microphone helped out for those online. And uh, I don't think it squashed any of your discussion. Though some of you who spoke a lot last week didn't speak this week, so maybe that was microphone-related. Joan? Oh, sorry, no, uh, not next week. Uh, so, yeah, we'll come back to it in a couple weeks. Next week is uh, Lord's Supper and lunch here. So we'll enjoy that together next week and jump back into the study the week following. Uh, so you have a full two weeks to get through a chapter, all right? All right, let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Lord, thank you again for these truths. Um, they're realities that we don't like to mess around with. They're realities that we don't like to think about. We don't want to face them. Uh, yet we know hardship is part of living in this life. And so help us as we learn how to lament properly, uh, grow the faith of your people, uh, even through the trials that you bring. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you. Lord bless you, and you're dismissed.